Hello everyone, I'm Mithma, one of the residents at Nepean Hospital, and today I'll be talking to you about shock and the use of vasopressors in the management of shock. In this talk, I'll attempt to cover a definition of shock, what the shocked patient may look like, the different types of shock, how to assess a shocked patient, and the management of shock. It's important to understand that shock is a very acute presentation and patients need to be supported so they can make it through their initial shock. Uh, just like in the film Home Alone, Kevin is initially quite shocked. He gets over that shock quite quickly and he's able to get up to all sorts of hijinks. Uh, now he's quite resilient and our patients unfortunately are not, so they require quite a bit more support than he does to get over their shock. Shock is broadly defined as a state of inadequate tissue perfusion, and initially this can result in tissue hypoxia, and if left untreated, it can actually result in end organ hypoperfusion and irreversible damage, which is why shock has such a high mortality. This equation is quite important in understanding how shock can occur. And here mean arterial pressure is used as a surrogate uh, for tissue perfusion. And it's composed of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. If either of these drops significantly without the other compensating adequately, you're going to get a reduction in mean arterial pressure, which is going to result in tissue hyperperfusion, hypoperfusion. Shocked patients are going to present in a multitude of ways. The most common symptoms and signs are usually tachycardia, uh, perhaps confusion, and poor urine output. Now, if you haven't specifically asked for um, input-output monitoring. Uh, this might not be recorded. And it's important to understand that shock often gets conflated with hypotension. However, it's not always, they don't always go together. So you can have a shocked patient who is not necessarily hypotensive, and you could also have a hypotensive per patient who is not shocked. Um, as shock progresses, the patient is going to get respiratory distress as they're trying to suck in more oxygen so they can perfuse um, their inadequately perfused organs. Um, if it's due to a blood loss um, leading to shock, they, the patients could look very pale and there's going to be evidence of end organ damage as shock progresses. This could be mesenteric ischemia, could be um, uh, increased uh, confusion, could be agitation, could be even coma. There are quite a few different types of shock, and I'll be attempting to sort of break it down and explain to you the different types of shock. Then I'll try to put them in categories that are used um, when you're trying to treat that type of shock. So the first type of shock is hypovolemic shock, and that happens when you have a reduced volume of circulatory fluid. And this, um, going back to our equation, this will result in a reduced um, stroke volume, which will in turn result in a reduced cardiac output, resulting in shock. Now, um, this can be because of diarrhea, where you're losing lots of fluid. Uh, you may also have electrolyte disturbances. It can be because of an acute blood loss or an active bleed, where you're just losing blood. And it can be because of something like burns, where you're, you're losing fluid to third spacing. The second type of shock is a dissociative shock, where you have adequate uh, volume. However, there's inadequate ability to carry oxygen to tissues. Um, for example, this can be because of carbon monoxide poisoning, where the hemoglobin in the blood is saturated with carbon monoxide in, over oxygen, and therefore you're not able to get tissue perfusion can also be with anemia when um, a patient with chronic anemia has an increased uh, metabolic demand.
Then there's septic, anaphylactic, and neurogenic shock. These are all distributive shocks, and they all occur because of excessive peripheral vasodilation. And in the case of septic shock, that's in response to uh, cytokine release because of systemic infection. In anaphylactic shock, it's because of cytokine release because of a systemic autoimmune reaction. And in neurogenic shock, it is because of unopposed parasympathetic activity because of um, a neuronal um, lesion. Then there's cardiogenic shock. And this is a reduction in cardiac output uh, as a result of the heart inability to pump effectively. And this can be because of an ischemic event, a papillary muscle rupture, uh, valvular failure, for example, secondary to endocarditis, uh, or a cardio, uh, cardiomyocyte con contusion. And finally, there's obstructive shock. Uh, and this is a reduction in cardiac output due to an obstructive cause. The examples um, are either a tension pneumothorax, a massive pulmonary embolus, or cardiac tamponade. And they reduce cardiac output either through reduced cardiac, uh, cardiac contractility or because of uh, reduced venous return. This table is quite good at differentiating between the different types of shock. So, for example, if you see a patient with warm peripheries that's shocked, you'd be thinking this is a distributive shock, um, most likely a septic shock or an anaphylactic shock, depending on if they've got known allergies or if they've got a known source of infection, if they've got a fever. Um, that being said, a patient with a septic shock could um, have cold peripheries because they've been shocked for an extended period of time and their compensatory mechanisms are now failing. Uh, another um, thing that you can look for is an, like an uh, distended neck veins, and this would point to an obstructive cause of shock. Uh, that's because you've got uh, the obstruction, which is causing right heart strain and therefore um, distending um, the IVC. There are also other signs that you can look for and certain things in the patient's history that you may know. Uh, if the patient's recently had a chest strain removed, they're at risk of a, 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 a pneumothorax. Um, if they've uh, recently been diagnosed with a DVT uh, and or if they have previously had DVTs, if they've got a known coagulopathy, um, if they've got a recent onset um, arrhythmia, uh, or if they're getting paler every second you're looking at them. Uh, these are all things that could point to the cause of shock. Uh, now I've only included um, like a few investigations here, it's because I couldn't really include a lot in the space that I had. Uh, but in reality, you'd be wanting to do um, bloods on everyone. You'd be wanting to do an ECG on everyone. You'd be wanting to do a VBG on everyone. And you'd possibly wanting a chest X-ray on all of these people as well. Um, now, bloods um, in hypervolemic shock is important because you'd be wanting to correct any electrolyte abnormalities. And you'd also be wanting to see what the hemoglobin is uh, to see if you need to transfuse the patient um, or if fluid support is enough. Then um, there's um, blood cultures, which is very important in a septic type shock because you'd be wanting to target the microbe that's being grown in the cultures. Um, an ECG or telemetry, I think an ECG at the minimum would be important in a cardiogenic shock uh, to see um, if there's a STEMI, if there's something that needs acute management. Then um, chest x-ray to CTPA for these obstructive causes of shock to see what we're dealing with and that would guide management. Which brings us to management. Uh, there are two sort of steps to management and the first step is supportive therapy. So uh, in the case of shock, you need to support these patients until they recover. 
uh, this include this can include fluids, um, and that's correcting electrolyte disturbances. Sometimes topping up electrolytes if they are in AF, you'd want to correct that. Make sure the magnesium and the potassium's um, high. And then there are vasopressors and inotropes, which are used to um, support the patient. There are quite a few different types and I don't know them all. These are the ones that I've worked with and kind of understand. Uh, metaraminol is usually the first uh, uh, vasopressor that um, is used because it can be given through a peripheral cannula. Uh, and this acts by releasing stores of already formed noradrenaline inside vesicles of neurons. So it acts and it acts and then nor noradrenaline acts on alpha-1 adrenergic receptors in preference to beta receptors to cause vasoconstriction. Um, uh, vasopressin can also be added on to uh, uh, a norad uh, preparation. These are given uh, via central line. They can be given, I think, peripherally, but um, it's, it's, it's preferred to be given in a uh, pr uh, central line. Uh, vasopressin causes vasoconstriction and also increases um, aquaporin receptors in the collecting duct, allowing increased fluid retention. And they work in different ways, so you can use them in concert. Then there's adrenaline, which um, is an inotrope and a vasopressor, and it acts on beta and, um, to a lesser extent, alpha um, receptors to cause peripheral vasoconstriction and also um, uh, to increase cardiac contractility. Then um, there are mostly the inotropes, which is dobutamine and mildrenone, and um, they both reduce systemic vascular resistance because in cardiogenic shock, you don't necessarily want to increase systemic vascular resistance and put more pressure on the heart. You'd want to reduce the resistance so that the heart can pump more effectively. Uh, dobutamine acts similarly to adrenaline uh, and acts on beta receptors. And milrinone um, blocks the breakdown of CMP. Um, it's, um, uh, and CMP is important in causing, um, in, uh, causing contraction of the my cardiomyocytes. Then uh, there's the definitive management, which is how you um, help a patient um, overcome their shock. And this is as simple as antibiotics. If it's a septic shock, you'd be wanting to cover what you think the source is. So um, it's you start with an empiric antibiotics. Once something's grown, then you can target the antibiotic management. Anticoagulation or thrombolysis, if it's a PE, um, this would be what would reduce the throm uh, the uh, the obstructive cause of shock, which would allow the patient to return to normal. Uh, if it's a, a tamponade, you'd want pericardiocentesis. And if it's a tension pneumothorax, you'd want needle decompression. If um, it's a cardiac um, cause, um, then there's surgeries or um, PCI. Uh, surgery could also be, if it was a neurogenic shock, you'd be wanting neurosurge input to um, alleviate um, the spinal cord lesion. And if it's an anaphylactic shock, an EpiPen. And all of these, uh, all of these definitive management um, options are what help a patient recover from their initial shock, so they no longer require uh, the support of vasopressors. Thanks for listening. Uh, I hope you learned something. Uh,